and good morning to you. Oh, that was a terrible response. I thought you would be friendly the second semester. If I said good morning again, you think you could do better in responding. Let's try it. Good morning. Ah, uh, this is the day the Lord hath made rainy. So, I, the Bible says, I will rejoice. It's hard to rejoice when your feet are wet and the rain is cold. I will rejoice and be glad. Glad in the Lord, not always in the circumstances. Today, I want to talk to you about your dreams. The dream and the vision that God has for you. And I wonder what dreams are sitting in your head this morning. And some of you are sitting here thinking, boy, I'd sure like to make it to the NFL, NBA. Oh, I'd sure like to make it one day to be a doctor of education and be the superintendent of schools or the principal. Oh, I'd like to make a million dollars, five million, 10 million. What I'd like to do, I'd really like to, and you begin to talk about writing that book. What great dreams do you have this morning? And so I have five questions to ask yourself about the dreams that you have. Five questions that will make you think about what dream you have. When I said what you said, when I was a freshman in Bible college, I really liked my professor of Christian life, who was the president of Columbia Bible College. And I began to say to myself, oh, I'd like to be a president one day. I want to be a college president. And I didn't tell people, but it was always there, always in my planning. And when I was 27, I became president of Winnipeg Bible College up in Canada. Little college, little college, and it never really got off the ground. Always, I was embarrassed for many years to tell people I only had less than 100 students. I'd get out in the churches, recruit, and do everything I could we could never break that 100 barrier. The college was so small, we had nine employees, including Cook, no janitors, the students did all of that. Faculty, all nine people, that was my staff, and it was difficult to get anything done. I loved being a college president for about six weeks. At the end of six months, I hated my job. I was a superintendent, and I had to talk to salesmen coming through. I was in charge of maintenance. The hot water heater broke down. We didn't have a maintenance director, so I had to call the repair people. I had to supervise the, I did all the maintenance work, and I wasn't able to keep up with my preaching, new sermons, my classes. I began to teach the same old stuff, and I wasn't growing. And I said, this is not what I want to do. I wonder if somebody had asked me a question when I sat where you sat. I wonder if someone asked me a question if I might have changed my dream. First of all, Jerry Falwell went to college. He was asked a question. And he was asked this question. What would you do if you knew you could not fail? Now suppose... You're playing basketball. What would you do if you knew you could make the NBA? Oh, you're working in business. What would you do if you knew you could make it in business, be the president of a company, become that millionaire? If you could retire with so much money at age 30 or 35, what would you do if you could not fail? What would you do if you knew that you could get the dream you wanted to do? Now, when you talk about that, let's look today at the dreamer, Joseph. And Joseph was a young man, and listen to how he's introduced. And the Bible says, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And so he's working, and he's the next to the youngest. He's got 10 older brothers, and he's 17 years old. Now, most of us are a little bit older than 17, and we've got 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and you've got dreams. Now, this Joseph got a dream, and God gave him a dream. He said, out in the field, there were seven sheaths of wheat out there, and all of the 11 bowed down to you, the number one. 
I'm going to ask the question, should he have told everyone what God told him? Or did he tell it wrongly? Did he tell it in a bragging way? Hey, guys, I'm the best. And we've all had our brothers and sisters mad at us at some time. And we do something and they don't like it, and we, we, we gig them a little bit. And so I wonder how Joseph told his brothers, hey, my sheath's going to be up, and you're going to be bowed down to me. But let's look. He's 17, jumped 13 years. He's 30. What are you going to do in the next 13 years? What are you going to be? What are you going to accomplish? In 13 years, Joseph didn't go straight up. He went down to accomplish the dream that God was going to give to him. 13 years, how old will you be? So some of you say, well, 13, I'll be 32. What do you want to be when you're 32? So this morning, think, follow me along. I've got some questions I want to ask you today. Now, notice what the Bible says at age 30. And Pharaoh had Joseph ride in the second chariot after him. And they cried out, bow the knee. At Pharaoh's sat um, Joseph over all the agriculture of Egypt. And therefore, he didn't make it to the top. He never became Pharaoh. But he was a member of the president's cabinet. He sat in the Oval Office with the president. And he rode in the procession. Chariot number two, because the world was starving, because the world was in trouble with the farms, they made him the second man. And so he became very important. Now, would you like to be Secretary of State? We've got people here who are in politics, in government. You want to go do something in government. I wonder what you dreamed this morning and what God will do. So I've got five questions I'm going to ask you. Five questions you need to ask yourself this morning. And these five questions are really the merit. Look at yourself. Look at your ambition. Look at your dreams to find out what you want to do. I love to tell the story of Dave Early, graduated in 1985. He always wanted to go back to his home in Columbus, Ohio and plant a church. So in October, I think it was 1985, I flew up and we organized the church in a junior high school. And after we got finished organizing, I got in his car and we were driving to his house to eat lunch and his wife was fixing for us. Well, as we passed by, he pulled off the road and it was just a little country stream, little country bridge, and it was a small bridge. And uh, outside, God, I said, look at this. He said, I've been looking at ground to buy. It's going to cost me a million dollars for the property. I, I don't have a million, but look, this piece, there's 10 acres here. And he said, see the stream? It winds back and forth through the brushes, the underbrush. It's wet. It's soggy. There's trees in there. But look at the side. He said, I could buy this, cut down all the trees, flatten the land out. I could build a church here. It's only going to cost $50,000. I said, Dave, that's a swamp. He said, no, no, no. Look at the church. I said, no, I see a swamp. He said, I see a church. I said, I see a swamp. Well, I want you to know, five years later, I flew up to uh, Columbus to dedicate a church in that swamp. And Jerry Falwell and I said there, and so as we got ready, I said, I want to tell you a story. And so with the dedication, I told the story, this is a swamp, but he had a dream. He worked hard, and he built an auditorium that will seat 400 people. Great auditorium. We had a great day. Two years later, we flew back up. We were dedicating an auditorium for 1,000. And he built the auditorium all for twice as big. And again, I told the story, Dave, this is a swamp. Now, I don't want to dump on your dreams, but I remember when I had about a oh, five, six-year-old daughter, my first one, she said, Dad, I want to be an astronaut. I want to, I want to, I want to go to the moon. Uh, I think uh, we are just about ready to go to the moon. And I remember kind of dumping on her. I said, well, Debbie, if you're going to be an astronaut, you got to get, go to college. You got to get physics. You got to get this. You got to get that. And you got to get that. And she looked up at me and she said, oh, Dad, don't kill my dreams. Don't let anyone kill your dreams. Don't let anyone believe you say, oh, this is a swamp. If you can see something, it's from God. First question I'm going to ask you. The ownership question, the ownership question. How do you know 
Your dream comes from God. How do you know this is something God wants you to do? You know, who knows? You know, you want to be a great basketball player, but you're too short and too awkward. And so you have to ask yourself some very basic questions. First question, it's, it's got to be um, Christ-centered. Jerry Falwell Sr. had a dream. We were talking about starting this college. He said, oh, I don't know anything about colleges. You've been on the board of, of the accrediting association. You've been a college president. He said, hire the faculty, write the catalog, schedule the classes. I'll raise the money. I'll build the buildings. I'll recruit the students. And together, we'll build the biggest Christian college in the world. Now, Jerry's vision was as big as his world, and his world was small. And so we thought 5,000 students. Boy, that'd be a great goal. That's about 500 more than Bob Jones at the time. That's about 500 more than Tennessee Temple. And so we always talked about, let's build a college. We're going to build the biggest Christian college in the world, 5,000 students. And I would always say to him, a little bit bigger. And I would kind of flash this sign at him. When I would walk up to sit on the platform at him, I would go like this, just, just enough to catch his eyesight. And he'd always smile, yeah. 5,000. And then he stands up about a year later, we're going to have 50,000. All of a sudden, his world was getting bigger. And I thought, 50,000? I'd like that. But 50,000? I didn't have faith to believe it. He did. That's why he's the founder, why he was the leader. He had faith to believe it. And so I, won't, I said, boy, 50,000 would be nice, but it's too many, too many butts out there. We'll never make it. He believed we would have 50,000, and we've had 50,000, and um, his goal was Christ-centered, and Jerry Falwell Sr. talked about 50,000. Now we've got Jerry Falwell Jr., and the old adage says, you must stand on the shoulders of those who go before and reach higher, and Jerry Falwell Jr. talked about having 100,000, and maybe even more. And his whole concept, I want to buy, he said, I want to complete, I want to fulfill the vision of my father. And so I love that commitment by Jerry, our chancellor and president, and I think we will complete that. Now, the second of all, it not only has to be Christ, it's got to be Bible-based. And there was a man who had a dream, Martin Luther King Jr. I never met him. I would have liked to have met the man who changed America. So many of the great politicians I've met, the great religious leaders, I, I always wanted to shake his hand. Now, I've shook the hand of many others, Jesse Jackson and others on his team, but not him. And he had a dream, but he didn't keep it to himself. One day he stood on the Washington Mall and he told a million people, I have a dream in Georgia. A little black boy, a little white boy will play together in peace. And I thought, that's great, I'm from Georgia. And I thought the idea was a magnificent, I thought it was biblical, it was based. And that one speech, and then based on Johnson, the president and civil rights, changed America. And when you ride down the street and you see a, a wheelchair ramp, and you see all that can be happening for women in ministry today, and the civil rights, there was a man who wanted everyone to be treated equal and he had a Bible, that's, that's Bible, that's Bible. When we started Liberty, we said from day one, we're not gonna be a Bob Jones. We're gonna have African Americans in from day one, and we did. And that young man who was here that first year is the bishop of a church, a number of churches in Haiti today. And so we are happy for changing and training people from all over. Now, you've gotta be Christ-centered, Bible-based, but your dream has to be ability-driven. You've got to be smart, but if you want to be a center in a basketball team, you've got to be tall. Okay, if you're going to be a linebacker, you've got to be something over 100 pounds, maybe 200 pounds. You can have great desire, but when they smash you and step on you and squash you, you know, what good is desire? when you're squashed. You've got to have ability. You've got to have ability. You've got to do something for God. And so I'm, I'm looking for people today 
God is looking for people who have the right ability. Get your education. Don't slack. Get your education. I talked to a student just yesterday, and one of the sharp students in my class, and I said, you made an A. He said, no, I made a B. A B? I said, I expected you to have an A. You did well on all my quizzes. He said, that paper, his words, I slacked off, and I deserve the B. I should have gotten an A. And I thought, boy, it's good to be honest, but it's not so good to slack off and not do the best you can do. Always do the best you can do. So the first question is the ownership dream. The ownership dream, how do I know my dream is from God? The second question is the arrogance question, the arrogance question. What will make people reject my dream? What will make people step on me, hurt me, divert me? All right, now when you talk about that, uh, some have destroyed their dreams by arrogance and uh, by other means. All right, let's listen to the scriptures now about Joseph. He had a dream. It was from God. Now, Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf rose and also stood aright, and indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more. Now that, that phrase occurs three times. They hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Probably the, the issue here, Joseph's dream was all about himself and not about God who gave it. Is your dream all about yourself and who you are, what you want, and the money you want? Uh, do, you, uh, do you have a dream based on the fact that uh, I can make a lot of money to do something for God. I can give a lot of money away. I can make a difference in the world. And so you have to ask yourself the question, is my dream about me or is it about God who gives the dream? You're at liberty. We talk about training champions for Christ. Dr. Falwell would stay from this pulpit. If it's Christian, it ought to be better. And you ought to have a, you ought to have a commitment to be your very best in all that you do. If it's Christian, it ought to be better. You ought to do more for God. And so here is, here's your arrogance, is the arrogance. Will you make people reject it because of ego and self and your own plans? There's nothing wrong with big plans. There's nothing wrong with big plans when God gives you big plans. Nothing wrong with doing something great for God when God helps you do something great. Is your dream more about you and, or is it more about God and what God will do for you? Third question, the cost question. What will my dream cost me? What will my dream cost me? If you wanna be a medical doctor, it's gonna cost you four years of college with a pretty good GPA and it's gonna cost you getting in a in a med school, and it's gonna cost three more years in med school, and then three or four more years internship, it's gonna cost you a lot of time. Are you willing to make that time commitment? I watch every once in a while ESPN, and I hear about the people who get up at three and four and five and six in the morning and go out and practice, and practice, and practice. And they make a commitment. What does it cost them? Sleep. What does it cost them? pleasure? What does it cost him? Sometimes you don't eat everything you want to do. There's a cost to build something great for God. Our seminary began here in 1973. There was a young man who came as an engineer. And when we talk about that seminary that first began, do we have a bird that's flying around today? I got you all laughing over here. Okay. <laughs> 
Al Henson graduated from the University of Tennessee with an engineering degree. Had a good, had a good job as an engineer working for the government and he sat on his back deck one night and looked out over Nashville, Tennessee. And when he saw Nashville in the lights, God spoke to him. He said, you need to plant a church, a big Bible teaching church, a church unlike anything that's in Nashville. And so he came and he was in our first class that was here. Al Henson determined to be a man of God, to trust God. And he sat and listened and he said, I'm gonna put God to the spot. And so he paid all of his bills and he took every bit of money he had and put it in the offering plate. Come to find out, uh, there was a couple here, Pop and Mom Morris. Now they used to be over right behind where the Jerry Falwell building, uh, a greenhouse. Mr. and Mrs. Morris planted all the trees up and down the boulevard that were lighted at Christmas time. They came and we had no money, put the whole landscape in. If you go by CVC, go over to Harvard Street, go to the top of the hill and turn right, there's a house there. And they lived right there so they could overlook and take care of us. And they talked to Al, they found, he put everything in the offering plate. And so they said, why don't you come live in our basement? And so for three years of the seminary, Al Henson lived at the top of the hill in the basement of that house right above CBCC. And uh, they lived there, God took care of them. But the most important thing is every Wednesday he would fast. He said, I'm fasting for my church or what I wanna do for God. I'm fasting for the future. And on every Wednesday afternoon, he and his wife would go over to the prayer chapel at the church and they would spend two hours praying about the future. Would you do that? There's a question of costs. There's a spiritual cost. There's a study cost. There's a discipline cost. There's a time cost. So if you're gonna have a dream, what about the cost? There's a second man I wanna to talk to you about. It's a friend of mine, Bill Monroe. Bill Monroe was from South Carolina. Back in about 1969, he was playing the piano in a church in Indianapolis. And one Sunday morning, God spoke to him. He said, there's no church in all of South Carolina that's getting souls saved today. He looked at the altar. There were about 12, 13, 14 people who had come forward to get saved. He said, I don't know of any church in South Carolina that's getting 13 saved every Sunday. He said, I don't, much less, maybe all the churches together. So he stops playing during the invitation and kneels down and says, God, I'm going to South Carolina to plant a church. And so he starts on his way to South Carolina and he's coming down I-77 through Ohio. He's got everything he owns in a rental truck and he pulls off to one of those rest stops and he is standing up stretching. His wife is sitting at a picnic table and she says, Bill, why are we going to South Carolina? What do you really think you can do? And he began to share his dream. He said, honey, I can see a big church. He said, it's gonna be beside the highway with these big Southern pines. And I can see the Southern pines and Spanish moss. And I can see azaleas, beautiful azaleas. And a yellow church building, yellow brick. And then I can see an auditorium. It's gonna be square, it'll seat a thousand, and up high in one corner will be a platform. And then a big choir, maybe a hundred people, he thought. And way up high is gonna be a baptistry. Bill told me that dream. I wrote it down in a book about church planting. And then one day I had the privilege of going to Florence, South Carolina, Florence Baptist Temple. It had been a tough time. When Bill arrived, all he could do was rent an old army airbase chapel. It had been painted black for the little theater. It was cold, it was wet. It dripped in the wintertime, it was hot. And it was cold in the summertime, it was hot. He said, terrible place to start a church. He said, when I would ask people to come to my church, he said, I know that building. You think it's safe to go there? It was tough to get it there. But I went there. And I, you know, when I drove off of 301 Highway, 
on the south side of Florence. There it was, the pine trees, the Spanish moss, the azaleas, the yellow brick building. I walked into an auditorium, square, seat a thousand. In that auditorium, I saw on one side, the pulpit, choir, and way up high, the baptistry. Now, out of that church came a lot of numbers, but numbers are not always the greatest thing. A young boy came out of that church. That's your home church, Johnny. That's where you found Christ. That's where you learned the Bible. That church changed your perspective of life. And so, you know, a great church always has fruit. And the fruit is not always numbers, not just people getting saved. I think in terms of the vision that Bill Monroe had, and it cost him something. So the first question, the ownership question, have you owned your dream? And the second question, the arrogance question, are you doing it for yourself or for God? The third question is the cost question. The fourth question, the perseverance question. Perseverance, uh, do I have the self-determination to continually move toward my dream? Do I have the self-determination to meet my classes, to study, to write the papers, to pass the test, to go for, don't quit, keep on going, self-determination. Prepare for your desert experience if you say you're gonna serve. Have you ever noticed in the Bible, those who are greatly used of God usually don't go from greatness to greatness. They have to go down into the pit, into the desert. And so Joseph, his brothers, they didn't just lie about him. They grabbed him, threw him in a pit. They're gonna kill him. One brother said, no, don't do that. And they sold him to traders, slave traders. They took him to Egypt, sold him to Potiphar. And Potiphar was kind of like um, head of the secret service for Pharaoh. And so he started working as a slave. And then he worked himself up till he's number one. And the wife lied about him and he's thrown in prison. Now he works himself up to number one. He becomes the trustee of the prison. And every, every time he turned around, things, he spent 13 years in the desert. So some of you say, when you, when you get out, you may get a little church. You may have to play basketball in Europe. You, not, no telling what you have to do to make it. You may have to go start. And you're not with the home office, the big office. They're gonna put you out in some podunk center to see if you can make it out there. You have to go out into your desert experience. It's cold, <coughs> it's dark, it's lonely, and you wonder if anybody knows whether you're alive or not. I write in my life story, my desert experience. I went to Canada. I thought I was on the edge of the world. And in Canada, I said, Lord, it's cold up here. If you ever get me down south again, I promise you I'll never complain about hot weather again. <clears throat> I learned a couple of things in Canada. I did everything I could to build this college. But out on the prairies, out on the prairies, there were two colleges. I had accreditation, didn't make any difference. And then we were the first college in all of Canada to be voted approval of liberal arts, to transfer liberal arts to state, to the provincial universities. Didn't make any difference. I still, all we, we had everything the world has, but these two men, Briarcrest Bible Institute and Prairie Bible, were huge. They were great men of God who could preach powerfully. And I came away from my desert experience, my long, cold desert experience saying, Lord, if I ever get next to a, if I ever get in a college again, I'm gonna find a man of God who's got the anointing of God, who's a leader of God, who's gonna do something great. I'm gonna hitch my wagon to his star and I'm gonna help him build a great college. I'd rather help someone than just do it myself. And when Jerry Falwell said, let's build a college together, that was God's open door for me. And so I learned in the dark experience of my desert that God, I learned what not to do, but I also learned what to do. The desert is good. It tells you what not to do. Now, Joseph spent 13 years in the desert, in slavery and in prison. And then Moses killed a man and spent 40 years in the backside of the desert. 
before God called him as an 80-year-old man. And then David, oh, David killed Goliath. And the women would dance. David has killed his 10,000. Saul has killed his thousands. And Saul got angry and jealous and tried to kill David. And David ran, again, 13 years in the desert, running with a man trying to kill you. And then finally, God had him king of both nations. And then Jesus went 40 days in the world. Wonder what Jesus learned in that 40 days when he fasted and went without food. Now the last question, the bottom line question. The bottom line question, uh, does my dream glorify God and benefit others? Does my dream glorify God? When my wife and I had our 25th anniversary, we decided to go to South Korea. We decided to spend our anniversary on the mission field. So we went to South Korea and lo and behold, in the same hotel was the uh, it was a life action, not the life action, it was the uh, Youth of Flame group. And they were there, young people from Liberty. They said, come go with us. And there was a young man there, Joe Hale. And we went out on the side of the hill to watch the city. And as we on the side of the hill praying and praying over the city what we we're going to do, Joe Hale excused himself, went over to a private hill. And God called him. He said, I'm to come back to Korea. I'm to build a school, I'm to teach, to make an impact on the entire nation. Now that was in 1978. And Joe Hale came back, finished his education, and then he started an organization. And today, Joe Hale has schools in over 20 capitals of foreign nations. Some Islamic nations, some secular nations, and so whether you go to Turkey or India or whether you go to Korea or wherever you go, you're going to find a school for the elite. It's the school for the children of statespeople, business people, military leaders. And so how can you impact a whole nation if you go get their children and you can teach? Many of you, you ought to go and spend a year teaching for Joe Hale, whether it's in Seoul, Korea, or whether it's in Jakarta, or wherever it is. And Joe Hale went out and did something for God. Uh, Shannon Breen. I wondered Shannon Breen when she was here, playing volleyball. I wonder what dream she had, that one day she would be on the Washington desk for Fox News, and she'd be up there at the National Convention interviewing all the great leaders. I wonder what Shannon thought, what dreams that she had, and how from the dreams of a girl playing volleyball here at Liberty, and what, what did God do in her heart? Every time I look at her, I say, yeah. Matter of fact, it was about two years ago. <laughs> about two years ago, I was watching Fox, and I saw this blonde-haired, good-looking, blue-eyed girl up there, and I said, boy, she looks familiar. Shannon Breen. And so I dug out my trusty iPad. Now, folks, when I'm watching television, I can tell you everything about people who are commercials because I don't just watch television. I Google all about them. And so I Google Shannon Breen. And when it said Liberty, I said, praise God. <laughs> I can tell you how old Vanna White is today. And she's a lot older than she looks. That's all I can say. Last person, last person, the last person I would expect to do anything of significance was Mark Lowry. Now, Mark Lowry, I would have called him a goofball. You agree with me, Mark, Brother Hine? He was always doing something. He would always find out where the line was. He would walk up to the edge of the line get as close as he could, and when you weren't looking, he'd step over, you know, just to prove he could do certain things. At graduation at the old shilling, not his graduation, but his mother's graduation. Now, his mother taught English for a while here, but when his mother finally graduated, he worked it out with one of his cohorts that he put a big net right over the platform 
and filled it with balloons and confetti. And at the right time when the, Jerry Falwell called her name and she walked over there, all of a sudden the net popped, the balloons came down, and the sound guy hit the hallelujah chorus. <laughs> Jerry Falwell looked at her and he said, Mark, I know you're behind this. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> now, he was a guy who liked to have fun. So it's nothing wrong with having fun. It's nothing wrong with having a great time here at Liberty. Do that. But he wrote a song that will be remembered by the ages. Mary, did you know that your baby boy? And every time I sing that song, I say, he's one of us. And I hear it, all people recording it. He's made an impact. He's made his dream come true through music. What are you going to do? You're going to sing? You're going to write? You're going to administer? You're going to sell? You're going to start something? Time to have a dream. Would you bow with me in prayer? Time to have a dream. The first question, ownership. How do I know my dream is from God? Would you pray right now, oh dear God, give me a dream, your dream of what you want me to do and help me to know it comes from you. Second question, the arrogance question. Are you gonna do it for yourself, your glory, or are you gonna do it for God himself? And so Lord, help me expand your kingdom. Your kingdom come in my life, your will be done. The third question, the cost question, Lord, I will pay the call. I will finish this college. I will get in my education. Lord, I will learn. I will be smart. I will conquer. Lord, I'll get the skills. Fourth question, preservation question. Will you continue? Will you discipline yourself? Will you stay in the battle? Don't give up. Don't give up. Lord, give me strength to continue. And the fourth, fifth question, the bottom line question. Does my dream glorify God? Does it benefit others? Lord, others. Help me to help me to dream for others. Father, I pray, bless this message. And may at one, may at least one student birth a dream in this chapel of what you can do. And Lord, help that dream to become a reality in your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.